So again, everyone, hello and welcome to today's event, Bridging the Gap Between Foundation Models and Enterprise AI. I'm John Marini, Director of Growth here at Snorkel AI, and I'll be your host for today's event. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that we'll have a live Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. You can ask any questions you have using the webinar Q&A pane at the bottom of your Zoom window, and these will be answered live at the end. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Snorkel AI CEO and co-founder Alex Ratner. Uh, and Alex is joining us now. I see you. Um, great. Well, as folks are joining in, I'm going to let Alex take a few moments to introduce himself. And from there, Alex, I'll hand the presentation over to you. Again, everyone, uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along using that webinar Q&A pane at the bottom of your Zoom window, uh, and those will be answered live at the end. See you at the Q&A. Awesome. Well, John, thanks so much for the uh, intro there and for setting this up. And thank you all for attending today. I'm uh, really excited to um, get to introduce some of what we've been working on at the Snorkel team and, um, you know, uh, uh, or yeah, within the Snorkel team on the foundation model front, what we're calling data-centric foundation model development. And hopefully also make this useful as, uh, you know, a, a session and a discussion for some of our, uh, uh, you know, data-centric viewpoint and, and uh, you know, on, on what's going on in the world of, of foundation models. And, uh, you know, if there's uh, interest in diving in deeper, we'll, we'll point, uh, we'll, we'll have about 50 minutes for Q&A. And also there's a ton of other resources on uh, the, the Snorkel website, also posted on archive uh, over the past year around various uh, research directions that have uh, you know, undergirded our, our, our views uh, here. And we'll dive into a, a little bit of a, a live demo. So hopefully this will all be interesting and thought provoking for folks, even outside of Snorkel flow specific stuff. And I'm looking forward, especially to the Q&A at the end. So please uh, log your questions. I'll, if I see a lot of them uh, queuing up, I'll, I'll even try to maybe end early, and we can go from there. So I'll, I'll uh, I see actually the the my rough estimation of the attendee count uh, uh, growth rate is that people are still filing in. So I'll take a minute or two to to do a uh, um, a non rushed intro, and then we'll get uh, started properly. So first of all, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO here at, at uh, Snorkel AI. Started the Snorkel project back at Stanford around 2015, 2016. We started working on broadly speaking data centric approaches. And I'm also on faculty at the University of Washington, where I get to wait, work with uh, with great students who are um, also working on some a lot a lot more foundation model stuff these days over the last six 12 months. So. I'll try to share perspective from all of those different hats. And obviously, first and foremost, what we've been doing here at Snorkel AI and, and recently announced. So I'll give it another minute. Uh, and then once we see the, the numbers uh, pause a bit, I'll also mention that I am drinking some disgusting looking beet juice today. Uh, because my normal juice didn't come, and if you see me grimacing throughout the presentations, I promise it's the beet juice, not not the uh, not the questions in the Q and A, and certainly not the subject matter, which I'm incredibly excited to talk about today. Okay, so I think we're we're stabilized here, and uh, with that, we'll jump in. So I'm going to go into some slides, and uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of anchoring on our view of the problem statement, uh, then go into some of the work we've been doing at Snorkel, and then we'll go into a couple of quick live demos before the Q&A. Great, so everyone should be able to see my uh, screen now. John, if there's any interruption at any point, please just chip in and let me know. And with that, we'll, we'll jump in. So I think, I'm going to take a wild guess that a lot of the reason people are here today is because they've, you know, heard about these uh, these these exciting advances seen as we've moved into the multimodal regime and, and, and increasingly, you know, some of this, you know, exciting wave of progress in the realm of, you know, what are uh, have, you know, traditionally been called often large language models as they become multimodal and we've been thinking about how to build on top of them. Um, many of us have started calling them foundation models. I'll use foundation models today, just for reference, or FMs. But I think a lot of us are here, I'm assuming all of us are here because we're excited by what we see, but potentially we're a little uh, stuck on, on how to actually use them and apply them to the types of problems that, that we work on. And that's what we'll talk about today. That's certainly our perspective on it. But just starting with the basics, I won't recap in too much detail, but there's been this incredible wave. This is a chart, I think, from The Economist of, of just the 
you know, um, you know the time axis and, and the compute scale in terms of, of computing resources, you can measure, you know, by, by, uh, by all kinds of measures, uh, data set size, parameter count, um, et cetera. But point is you're seeing this, this massive wave of progress, even the last six, 12 months, scaling up these, these kind of classic self-supervision or language modeling techniques um, that have been around for decades with modern transformer architectures and massively upgraded and upscaled compute uh, and, and uh, compute infrastructure. And, and of course, uh, data sets commensurate to that. So it's a really exciting time to be in AI. And uh, obviously people are flooding in as a result. And, and some of this is because of how accessible and exciting and, and fun this stuff is for lack of a, uh, a better uh, phrasing of it. Um, uh, you know, here we've got a, a Dolly 2 image of a raccoon. Uh, and then we've got some some you know chatbot transcripts, and I, I can uh, if we really run short on content in the Q and A, I'll share some of my uh, my you know handiwork on stable diffusion as an amateur there. But point is, there's this incredible leap forward that we can you know even without quantitative quantifying it very precisely, see and 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 interact with. And it's especially as I'll talk more about it but today, this perspective, it's really around these kind of generative exploratory or, or human loop tasks, right? I wanna you know, create some copy text and have a starting point and iterate on it. You see a, an explosion of, of um, you know, workflow tools and, and use cases there. I have some creative images that I want to build, right? We'll get into how this is different from a lot of what you know, predictive or, or automation focused AI traditionally and still looks like, but it's incredibly exciting. So what are the gaps? There's got to be a little pessimism to, to set the stage for something something new here. What are the gaps between all of that that massive rush of progress and and real enterprise usage of foundation models? First and foremost, I'm guessing many of you are here because you have you know seen some of these these gaps. You've seen that there is a gap between these amazing demos on Twitter and your actual use cases. If, if you're, you're skeptical of that, we'll talk more about it, but it's certainly our, our view that there's, uh, there are significant gaps between you know, the excitement and the actual deployment. Um, and you know, today I'll break it down into two categories, two kind of themes. One is adaptation, the other is deployment. So the adaptation gap, quote unquote, is this, this you know, basic and, and very classical notion that if you have this big generalist self-supervised model, you need to do additional work to adapt it for specific, uh, you know, specialized use cases, data distributions, et cetera. Um, this can be done via fine tuning, prompting, various, you know, zero or few shot approaches. Um, but either way, this is obviously, uh, you know, a, a classic and still on the present challenge. And the second is deployment. How do we actually serve these hu you know, humongous and 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 poorly understood uh, models in production, especially in real critical enterprise use cases. So let's start with adaptation. Um, there's a little bit of a, a you know, a, a pseudo or, or, you know, almost quad chart here that frames a little bit of how, how we think about it. And I'll take a minute to walk through this. Basically on the Y axis, you know, this is what I'm calling problem complexity. Problem complexity, you know, can be measured uh, or, or thought of, you know, intuitively in terms of, um, you know, how non-standard or bespoke is the data distribution? In other words, if I'm looking at, you know, classifying, you know, restaurant reviews from open web uh, text, that's probably going to be easier given the abundance of that information online versus if I'm trying to, you know, do some kind of classification extraction task over complex legal documents or, or medical records or anything kind of specialized and, and less present in, in the open web. Uh, problem complexity also could have to do with, you know, various things like how many how many things am I trying to predict? Is this a, a binary classification problem or a, a, a you know five thousand way classification problem, et cetera? And then on the y on the x axis, uh, you know here we're thinking about accuracy requirements. And I'll start with that x axis gap. There, there's a real bifurcation in the space in terms of what we see between these kind of uh, exploratory creative tasks where there's not really an accuracy bar. You're just trying to generate something. That that looks reasonable and and probably you know in a human loop fashion iterate on it thereafter, and these predictive or automation tasks where you actually need to ship a model to production that runs on its own at a high accuracy uh, bar. Now 
this kind of maps classically to generative versus discriminative modeling. I think that's the, that's the, the nerdier way to talk about this split. Am I generating content that I'm going to then iterate on further and do something with? Um, or am I actually trying to train a discriminative model, a classifier, an extractor, et cetera, that needs to perform at high accuracy repeatably within understandable, you know, and, and formalized uh, uh, error bars? So this is a, you know, one of the biggest and most basic one-on-one -on -one splits in the space. Foundation models and all the latest stuff that has been coming out is, is that they're fantastic for these generative or exploratory creative human loop tasks. I want to create some copy text. I want to create some images. They need to be adapted to actually perform at any kind of real discriminative or predictive automation task. Now on the y-axis in that right half, you know, there are settings where it's pretty easy to do a little bit of adaptation, to do some prompting, some zero or few shot learning, some, you know, gener some, some, some kind of fine tuning is still the workhorse technique um, on simple tasks. But there's this big upper right quadrant where adaptation is very non-trivial and very critical to actually get to uh, a, a usable application. So I'll, I'll give an anecdote to, to, to um, accentuate this, this adaptation gap. Um, I, uh, uh, like many people here, have been playing around with, with uh, multimodal generative models uh, or foundation models that are out there. Here is something I was playing around with, with Stable Diffusion uh, 1.5, and I was trying to make the Snorkel logo. And if you've seen the Snorkel logo, which we've had for years, uh, I couldn't quite get there. I couldn't get an octopus wearing a snorkel underwater. I guess that's a little bit too far outside of the, 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 the support distribution. But I did about 30 samples before I, I, I petered out. And I got the image on the left, which I think is pretty cool. And it's certainly astounding that that's you know, generated straight from you know, a noise vector uh, through these, these modern generative approaches. And this was an awesome, in my view, success case of a generative human loop type process to get me a, a creative asset like this. But if you think about it from a predictive or discriminative modeling perspective, let's just say a predictive or automation uh, uh, kind of uh, approach, um, this took me 30 samples before I got one success. That's a 3.3% hit or accuracy rate. You can never ship any model uh, to production. Some of you probably you know, are, are cringing at the idea of going to your you know, model risk management or governance committee with a 3.3% accuracy model and trying to ship that to production. So this is just an anecdote to accentuate this gap between this generative human loop type usage and you know, predictive or automation type applications. Another key piece of the intuition I, I kind of already mentioned before is this you know, very classic, very intuitive gap between generalist and, and specialist. Now, I think it's very risky as a general rule to make uh, comparisons between, um, you know, AI and, and, and human learning, because there's such a gap still, and, and it can be quite dangerously misleading. But in this case, I think it's, it's fair just to say at a high level, if someone learns to read on, on, on Reddit and Wikipedia, would you expect them to instantly be able to go in and, and you know, deal with multi-hundred page legal documents or you know, oil and gas drilling reports or clinical trials information? No, you'd expect them to have to go through some significant specialist training. It's no different here. Um, so, you know, this idea of having to adapt a generalist to become a specialist, again, a very classic idea, and it is still omnipresent when you get into real world use cases here. And just to wrap up this, this motivations section, you know, the workhorse method for doing this fine, this adaptation is still fine tuning with. If any of you have checked out Snorkel before, you're going to be utterly shocked by what I'm going to say next with labeled training data. And you can see here, this is just from one survey paper uh, that came out recently in 2022, where we look at kind of, uh, it was, this is on, I think about 16 benchmark tasks, you know, zero shot approaches, few shot approaches, which is, you know, what you put various prompting techniques into and then fine tuning um, on, you know, up to uh, uh, half a million labeled data points. And you can see that to actually get near production levels of quality here, we're, we're reaching 87% you know, fine tuning is, is still the way to go on these complex tasks. And, and, and arguably these are still benchmark tasks. They're not even approaching the level of complexity in you know, some of the most valuable and important enterprise use cases in the real world. So again, even with these great foundations that you're building on top of, in real settings, you're once again blocked on labeling training data, which is obviously where we've worked for years, speeding it up through programmatic and, uh, and, and weak supervision techniques. 
So there's one other gap, and, and, I, and I'll, I'll be a little bit briefer on this one, but I want to underscore that, in, in my opinion, this is one of the most underrepresented and, and, and in many ways, most challenging gaps to actually shipping foundation models to production. And this is around actually deploying them in, in, in enterprise settings and critical use cases. This is especially true for, say, regulated industries. Uh, we work with a lot of customers in, in, you know, in finance, medical, et cetera. But it's also true for anything where there are, you know, significant negative consequences to, 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 you know, doing something wrong. Again, if I'm playing around with stable diffusion and I get a slightly awkward looking octopus, I'm probably fine. But that's not true for most AI use cases in terms of the consequences of, 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 um, inaccuracies, biases, et cetera. Um, so the kind of first roadblocks that we're dealing with as a field right now are about you know, cost and latency. And I won't go into the details here, but you know, the foundation models, they are very expensive to serve at scale. Uh, there's latency issues, um, et cetera. We're chipping away at that. There are likely to be some fundamental barriers where we just can't get it down to where we'd like to. And as we'll get to later, you don't actually need to. Uh, to do this. So we'll, we'll get back to that. But I think the other bigger challenge is just that we have a very nascent understanding of foundation models. Uh, I've had some great conversations with, with uh, some, you know, with colleagues on the academic side about how foundation, the, the emergence of these foundation models have actually kind of turned machine learning, even some of the most, you know, kind of theory heavy uh, uh, formal folks into kind of natural scientists. We're kind of poking and prodding at the emergent properties of these things. And so from a governance or a model risk management perspective, um, there are many challenges ahead to being able to just put these in production. And that's something that we hear echoed from our customers in many verticals uh, that they are, at least for a, a big chunk of their most important and valuable and, and critical applications, there might be years of barriers to actually shipping a foundation model in production. So that is um uh that is kind of the um the the uh the quick summary of these adaptation and deployment gaps that we see and uh I'll jump in in a second to how we actually are going about proposing solutions to them now i saw a um uh, i saw a, a a hand raised i don't know if uh someone wanted to jump in live i'm i'm happy to to do live uh john i i think we were default going to do it through Q&A at the end? I don't know if we have yes, a thought there. Yes, but... if anyone wants to come on live uh, and join Alex on the stage, I can promote you up. So uh, if you are interested in that, just go ahead and raise your hand and then I'll uh, direct chat you and, and we can make sure that's what you'd like to do. Um, so I'll handle those for you, Alex. Uh, and if I see any raised hands, I'll reach out to folks. Awesome. And we'll leave time for that at the end too. So uh, always, always uh, happy. I'll pause at these kind of interstitial points. Would, would, would definitely make it fun. Um, and either instead of or in addition to that, please put your your uh, you know questions or conversation topics in the Q and A too, so we don't we don't forget to get to it at the end at latest. Okay, so that's a little bit of stage setting, and this is not specific to Snorkel. This is I think uh, uh, still an under voiced opinion in the space. Everyone is still getting you know through the excitement of how incredible the the generative you know exploratory use cases are, um, just beginning to see how significant these adaptation and deployment roadblocks are in real use cases. And this is where uh, our motivation has started and, and, uh, and anchored on over the last year of uh, a roughly year of work in this area. So I'm really excited to, um, to, to jump in and now talk about uh, what we call data centric foundation model development. Um, and actually, I'm just looking at the questions now. I, I, I will, um, I'll just briefly talk about them live as they come in. Um, so first question, you know, what is a, a foundation model? We can double back to that. Um, this is a synonym for a large language model. And we can talk in the Q&A if folks are interested, both about the basics of, of large language or foundation models and kind of recap some of that that I went through at the beginning kind of quickly, as well as talk about why I'm saying foundation model versus large language model. And then Rahul had a question about double clicking on why foundation models are expensive to host. Um, we can dig into some of the, the the details and math there, and there are lots of resources uh, beyond ours. So I'll save the detailed version for Q and A. But um, suffice to say, these these models have you know hundreds of billions of, of parameters, and while uh, you know techniques have gotten uh, quite advanced at serving and training large models, they are still very expensive to run. Now, again, I don't think cost is going to be 
ultimately the long pole in the tent, I think actually governance and 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 you know understanding how to put proper guardrails around these models is going to be the biggest one for deployment. But um, we can come back to that as well. I think it's a great question. We can go into more depth. Okay, so we'll circle back there and, and have more time to chat. But with that, I'm going to jump into what we call data-centric foundation model development in Snorkel Flow. So first of all, I'll say it at a high level, uh, and we can we, we, we can talk more about this as well. Um, data-centric is you know the the idea we've talked about for years that a lot of the development of, of AI in general increasingly centers around some operation of iterating on and developing the data, and we often focus on the training data that models learn from or that you know they are fine tuned on in this case, much more so than say tinkering with the parameters of models or the the, the you know choices of their architectures. Now, for you know traditional training, this is why we focused on labeling and developing training data, doing it programmatically much faster, um, and other operations around the data, slicing, augmenting, sampling. Data centric again here refers to the fact that a lot of the key leverage points for getting to success with foundation models actually has to do increasingly with the data. And before jumping into our development solution here, I'll just note that if you actually go look around, and we've written about this more on, on the blogs, and check out the latest papers on, on actually training foundation models, you'll note uh, a, a, an interesting and not so subtle thing that the architectures of these models are, are usually more or less the same. The infrastructure is often bespoke and custom, but, but follows similar principles. The data sets that they're trained on, how those data sets are curated and, and labeled and, and, and collected, um, is often the key differentiator even in building foundation models. So even in building them from the ground up, we're seeing foundation models increasingly rely on surprise, surprise, the data they're trained on. Actually, my colleague at UW, Ludwig Schmidt, has a great paper on looking at this in terms of CLIP, if you want to get into the details there, lots of other anecdotal examples. So I'll note that and then dive into what we focus on, which is once we have a foundation model that is trained, how do we actually adapt it and get it ready for deployment, which again, our opinion is that it has to do with data center approaches. Um, and that's why we're so excited to fit it into the, 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 the snorkel flow paradigms and workflows that we've supported uh, to date. And by the way, if you're new to snorkel and snorkel flow, uh, there are lots of resources. I won't spend a lot of time rehashing what the core work workflow looks like, but we'd, uh, we'd love to, to get you up to speed through a variety of other resources. So in, in, uh, in our new approach to data center foundation model development, um, there are basically three key tools that uh, all leverage foundation models in different ways. The first one is what we call warm start, which is using foundation models to auto label uh, and, and uh, um, kind of jumpstart your data centric development process. The second is prompt builder, which is uh, basically a development kit for uh, developing tuning and, and, um, and integrating and modeling various prompting strategies of foundation models. And then we offer fine tuning support for actually doing this, this fine tuning. That's just a list and a manifest. I'll get into what, you know, how these actually fit together uh, in a second. And if you'll just give me a second, I just uh, uh, need a uh, two second break because I'm dealing with a, a preschool cold. While we have Alex on his quick break, uh, we do see a lot of questions coming in. So definitely, folks, uh, keep adding those questions to Q&A, and we'll have uh, plenty of time here at the end uh, to answer those live. Yeah, and I guess I should clarify that. Uh, what I mean is I have a daughter in preschool, and she's a, you know, the cutest little disease vector that you can imagine. And I have gone through, like, my 15th cold now. So apologies for the, uh, the break there. But anyway, let's jump in now. And thank you all for the questions. Keep, please keep... keep um, uh, dummy them and th these are great uh, questions that I may pick off kind of quick ones, uh, but otherwise I'll, I'll save them for the Q&A session that we'll get to around 1045 because I think some of these are really good, you know, slightly deeper conversation topics. So before jumping in, I'll just note that there's there's a lot of uh, uh, research that we put out there that undergirds a lot of the concepts I'm going to go into. And so in terms of actual, you know, in product demonstration, we'll get there in a second. But there's also a lot of work if you really are, are masochistic and want to dive into the details. Uh, we'd love you to check it out. We'd love your feedback. Um, you know, some of this started back in in, in March. 
this uh, for those that are that are real, um, you know, uh, data centric or weak supervision nerds on the on the, the webinar. There's there's a bunch of work that um, either the Torkel research team has done uh, and or uh, the, the group at Stanford, where my, my co-founder, Chris, is a professor at UW elsewhere. You know, we've looked at um, uh, using, you know, kind of fusing uh, foundation models and weak supervision, uh, using uh, uh, the large language models for weak supervision. Um, uh, a lot of other things I won't go through, but this this is uh, kind of some of the work on the academic and validation side that we've done, as we usually do with our development, kind of pre as a precursor to what we are going to show today in, in product. Okay, so diving in, I'm going to talk about kind of two basic stories around adaptation and deployment and how we aim to solve those in, in SnorkelFlow with these techniques. We'll start with, with just adaptation. So let's say you are able to actually deploy a foundation model in production. As we covered before, what you need to do is you need to be able to fine tune it. Fine tuning generally requires labeled training data, or it, it requires labeled training data, and generally a lot of it. And that is kind of our, our sweet spot what we've worked on for the last seven, eight years and the last couple of years of the company is programmatic or, or you know, programmatic and or automated approaches to labeling and developing and improving the quality of training data in, in ways that can be you know 10 to 100 plus X faster than you know, just kind of click, click, click manual labeling uh, like you do in the legacy approach. So this is kind of a straightforward uh, story. Uh, this is where you can um, uh, just kind of go and you know, build up your training set and then just fine tune modern foundation models right in the Snorkel UI. And we'll see this in a demo when I switch to that in a second. But again, the key uh, question around uh, the challenges is not just how do I adapt foundation models, but how do I actually deploy something in production? And the approach that we take here is actually using foundation models, not for production deployment, because again, many of our customers, most of our customers can't right now just serve a big foundation model like a GPT-3 in production, but rather using foundation models as tools to auto-label data, to power data-centric development, and then ultimately using the results to train a smaller model that can actually get served to production, that can fit on your ML ops infrastructure. And that often is you know, over a thousand times smaller and just as or more accurate on your target problem. So another way of thinking about this is using generalist foundation models that are you know, very powerful, very amazing, but you know, very undertuned for your specific problem using potentially multiple of them, various prompting and other strategies, other labeling approaches that can be used to further refi refine and correct their outputs, and then distilling all of that into a, um, a specialist model that you can actually deploy. So this is um, you know, building on classical techniques, but it's a kind of new workflow, at least from what we've seen in the foundation model space for taking all this amazing information, iterating and correcting and refining it for your specific use case, and then ultimately baking it into something that's an actual deployable artifact that you can ship on your ML ops infrastructure in your governance or model risk management structures today, not several years from now. So uh, we can we can uh, go into that, but you know another um, bit of detail there is the cool thing about how this fits into Snorkel Flow's uh, abstractions is that in this abstraction, a foundation model is just another type of what we call a labeling function that can be used to label data. This means that using the same techniques we've worked on for years, it can be automatically combined and merged with all sorts of other ways of labeling data, manual labeling, programmatic labeling from heuristics or rule-based approaches, uh, embedding or, or, or automated based approaches. So basically you can take all of these different strategies for labeling your complex domain specific data, now including ones powered by foundation models, and use that to develop training data for training some model that actually can be deployed in your or, in your organization's uh, um, you know uh, infrastructure. So that's the high level idea. And um, at this point, I will uh, jump into a demo. Then we'll go through a couple of customer case studies, and then we'll wrap up from there. Give me a second just to switch screens.
apologies, one second. Great, I don't know what my computer was doing there, but we are back. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen right now and I'm gonna go into a, uh, a demo environment. Okay, so this is a quick little view. I'm not gonna go through a whole workflow. I'm just gonna take maybe five, six minutes to, to, to go through uh, some of the features. So basically what we're doing is we're taking the same data centric development process of labeling and developing your training data through programmatic automated techniques so you can rapidly build custom deployable models and we're baking foundation models into various parts of that to accelerate this whole workflow. So again, we can talk about this more, but the high level idea here is, okay, great. If you can deploy a production foundation model, great, we can help you fine tune that. But in most settings where that is gonna be challenging and, and frankly is unnecessary, we're gonna use foundation models to accept, accelerate data labeling, accelerate data centric development. And then that ultimately can be used to train any size or type of model that will both be smaller, most likely, and higher accuracy on your target task and can be deployed to production. That's the that's the high level workflow we'll go through. So where, where are the places where it jumps in? Well, we've introduced three to start. One is what we call warm start. So here, if you enter our, our, uh, our data studio, which is for programmatic uh, data labeling and data center development, you get a, a new uh, uh, you know, kind of intro pane and everything here is, is, uh, is still in, in beta. So there are, uh, you know, mods coming, but basic idea is I can go and and the second I upload my data, I can now auto generate a bunch of labeling techniques or labeling functions using the power of foundation models. So here I have options of either zero shot learning where we just use class names or descriptions uh, or few shot learning techniques um, where in this case, I've got a couple of data points of ground truth per class of this, this toy problem. And, and so I'm good to go. By the way, the toy problem I'm showing here is, is a, a very toy problem. It's the, the canonical uh, ham versus spam email classification problem. So very classical example in machine learning, very toy. But again, this is just a quick demo, not a full walkthrough. Um, if you wanna see details of more complex problems, uh, we recently published a blog post. We'll go through quickly uh, a case study along with some of our colleagues at, at, uh, at Brown and Stanford on um, a, a still public, but but um, much more complex 100 way uh, legal classification benchmark task. So we'll talk about that a little bit at the end if we have time. So basically at this point, you know, I can go ahead, I can pick my uh, my foundation model, and then I can just go ahead and say, uh, get me started. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna start uh, creating some, in this case, everything that we dump in is what we call a labeling function. So it's going to automatically use a few shot approach to train up a foundation model uh, or to use a foundation model to auto label my data. Will this get my data labeled perfectly uh, correctly on a real problem? Almost certainly not is, is what empirical studies, both ours and others show, but it can auto uh, kind of kind of warm start, hence the name, your process. So you're not labeling from scratch. You're starting with a bunch of auto labeling already done. And now you can use the data center development tools and snorkel flow uh, to just you know zero in on where there are error modes that need to be connect, uh, corrected. So once we've done that, I'm just going to skip ahead uh, to to where it's already been created. Now we have you know some some labeling functions. You can see snorkel flow automatically starts estimating you know how good these labeling functions are. In this case, they're very good because this is a toy problem, uh, and and you know it probably isn't that challenging to solve. But you know. In most problems and the ones that we we go into further, there there's you know a lot left to do still. So in that case, I'm going to show our our next kind of approach, which is um, what we call our prompt builder, and this is a way of prompting um, large language models in more in more specific ways. Again, prompting prompt engineering is is a very hot hot topic these days. This is basically our suite for doing prompt engineering and development, and it builds on years of our work on formalisms for how to to um, model and integrate imperfect signals. In this case, a prompt is just one of those signals and it fits directly into some of the formalisms and theory we've worked on for years. Uh, if you're curious for more of that, you can read, for example, the latest paper from the Stanford lab that my co-founder runs uh, uh, called AMA. Uh, um, it's on archive, but I'll pop back up to the high level. So here I can go into this new kind of prompt builder 
And there's a bunch of templates I can use. So I, I have, you know, we have a bunch of kind of, and here I'll, I'll get a little into the weeds for folks who are, you know, following the latest in, in uh, various prompt engineering techniques. Um, you know, we can, we can talk about this in more depth later. Others is just, I'll keep it kind of high level, but there are a couple of basic templates uh, by which we can prompt the, the large language models. So the first one we'll start with is just asking a yes, no question. So I can say, you know, is this spam? Um, and I can go ahead and, and preview and it'll use this prompt uh, to start basically querying the foundation model and getting some results of um, uh, against real data. So it's going to start giving me results back live and I can see uh, a bunch of examples of where it actually thinks it's spam. Uh, and um, I can also play around with the confidence threshold. So, you know, if I uh, increase the, the confidence threshold, I can try to, you know, improve the precision here. So basically I'm, I'm uh, you know, kind of trading off precision and recall. You can see I can uh, look at this live and I can say, okay, I want to, you know, I want the foundation model to be more confident before calling something spam. And, uh, and I can see that now I've got a, a pretty precise, although somewhat low recall labeling function, and I can go ahead and, and just uh, you know, dump this in. But uh, I, I want to quickly show off a couple of other ones. So there's a bunch of other workflows. Uh, you know, entailment is a, proper, is a popular prompting technique. Uh, Q, you know, question answering format is a prompting technique. There's also a, a freeform uh, builder. So here, for example, we have uh, the two ingredients to using prompting for a classification problem, the, the, uh, the prompt itself, and then there's a, a mapper that maps the output of the foundation model to an actual uh, label for our classification problem. So in this case, I can, for example, say topic extraction, and here I'm going to prompt the language model. I'm gonna feed it the context of the email and just ask it, what, is it, what topic is this about? And then what I can do is I can go ahead and say, okay, well, if the foundation model thinks it's about, you know, topics like, you know, life insurance, um, I don't know, what are, what are spam topics, uh, uh, you know, um, watches, um, I'm, I'm blanking here, I'll just leave it at that. Now I can go ahead and, and start uh, previewing this. So what is this doing? I'm using a, a, a prompt template just asking the foundation model, what topic do you think this email is about? And then I'm using a little bit of domain knowledge um, you know, about common topics that are likely to be spam to map the output of that question to some actual class labels for my problem. So taking a step back, this you know, is, is, a, is a way of basically taking all this amazing generalist knowledge in the foundation model, but also kind of mixing it in with some domain knowledge that I have about the problem. Again, in this case, Domain knowledge about spam versus ham is maybe not the most technical field, but especially in real world problems where you have subject matter experts that have deep knowledge about their area, say contracts or healthcare that the foundation model doesn't. This ability to you know, prompt the foundation model and then use some expertise to map its outputs to, to your actual problem can be quite powerful. Um, I'm gonna let that uh, run. There's a lot more there. And if you can tell from the kind of you know, toolkit here, there's a lot of stuff that you can do. Our goal is to both suggest kind of best in class prompting techniques, but also give full developer freedom to try out you know, all of the latest new ideas, whether from yourself or from others in the field about how to prompt and, and how to engineer and develop these prompts for foundation models. The final thing I'll just note is uh, whether I've, I've used those foundation model based labeling approaches or I've just labeled an old fashioned, you know, manual or programmatic way. Let's say I actually can deploy something like GPT-3 to production in my environment, and I wanna now use Snorkelflow to fine tune that model. Uh, I'll just kind of preview that there's now, you know, built in support for this. I can say, okay, I wanna train fine tune GPT-3. I can select, you know, in this case, uh, we just have GPT-3 plugged in right now. Um, uh, and I can go ahead and say, go ahead and train, and this will give you a preview of the estimated cost, and then you can go ahead and just kick off fine tuning. So I will stop there. Hopefully that gives a little bit of a, a, a real preview to this uh, overall workflow. Let me go ahead and pull up the slides again. And then we'll wrap up in the next five minutes with just a couple of examples and then head into Q&A. Uh, give me a second. 
Okay. So now we're back to just a few more slides. And again, just to recap what we saw before moving on to some examples, you know, basic idea is that that last feature I showed, the ability to just do push button fine tuning of the latest and greatest, uh, you know, uh, foundation models, and to do that with the full, uh, you know, programmatic automated data labeling approach of snorkel flow, you know, if you're able to just do fine tuning, you can just use that feature alone to get 10 to 100x faster, uh, uh, you know, time to value on fine tuning a big model via improving the training data labeling approach. But the other tools I showed were all these more advanced techniques for basically push button auto labeling via warm start and then more fine tuned auto labeling using prompt engineering that let you use foundation models as a powerful way to accelerate your data centric development, your data labeling, and then ultimately use the results of that to train any model, most likely a much smaller, cheaper and deployable model that is actually as or more accurate on your task. So basically we're trying to let you use foundation models and all their generalist knowledge, refine, combine, tune it, but also combine it with other sources of knowledge and ultimately deploy it in a form factor that you can actually ship to production. So what are some, some early results? Um, you know, we tried this out with a top US bank customer of ours, uh, top, top five US bank, and they were able to um, basically use these various techniques to improve the quality off of a baseline that we were playing around with together of just a, a, uh, a few shot uh, or a fine tuning, a fine tuned approach. Um, so they were uh, th these, um, these numbers on the left. Um, I'll give a brief premise. This is an, um, you know, without giving away any specific details, this was an anti-money laundering, know your customer type problem where there were uh, large packets of very complex uh, bespoke documents having to do with large institutional customers and we have you know, hundreds of things that we want to extract to power an AML KYC process. So in this case, this is a, an extraction and, and, and tagging problem. And here I'm just pulling out three examples of where uh, folks at this customer of ours were trying to just do a little bit of light fine tuning of a foundation model. Uh, and you can see that for all but a couple of the easiest extraction targets, this, you know, fine tuning of a foundation model didn't magically work. And it's again, not surprising because this is a very bespoke, complex data distribution. You wouldn't expect a gigantic model, even a multi hundred billion parameter one that's trained on web text and web domain information to be able to capture it perfectly. But the key was that by using additional fine tuning and prompt building techniques, we're able to get the, the quality up uh, on average 3.6 times. Um, you know, we also, uh, got to do some great work with a, a global home goods e-commerce company. They were able to improve their F1 score on a content tagging and classification uh, uh, approach over images by over 28 points of F1 score. And uh, one uh, other example is from one of our customers, Pixability. They do IAB video classification to help with, with ads placements over YouTube videos, a very complex, very high cardinality, you know, many, many labels uh, kind of type of task. And they were able to use these approaches. I won't go into detail because we're, we're running a little short on time, but if you're interested, feel free to read more in the case studies. Basically, they were able to use um, this, the, the prompt builder techniques to, um, to train a model that they could actually ship scalably using these, these, uh, these techniques and some of their domain knowledge. And they were able to train a 600-way classifier um, that got above their, their accuracy bar of 80%. Uh, produced about 400,000 programmatic labels. And they were able to effectively in that way, distill all this great foundation model knowledge, refine and correct it for their very specific and complex uh, problem setting, and then produce a, a, a you know, production shippable model that was uh, uh, much smaller. One last thing I'll go through just to give a, a brief case study. Again, I'm gonna go through the details quickly here and then we can uh, either, you know, th th this is all posted online if you're curious. Uh, or we can uh, use some of the Q&A time to address it. But this is a case study that we published on a public data set that is still simpler than many of the problems that our customers use Snorkel Flow for, but a little bit more representative. It's a 100-way uh, uh, classification task over a, a, a data set of legal contracts called the Ledger Base uh, Benchmark data set. And we were able to uh, show that as compared to a baseline of just fine-tuning GPT-3 with manual labeling, you can actually get a model that is you know, thousands of times smaller uh, net cost of, of less than 0.1% uh, 
and you know same accuracy level. So I'll go through this quickly, but a, a little bit of what we did again using all those features I just showed was we took a whole bunch of, of different uh, foundation models, GPT-3, FLAN, uh, Cohere, AI-21 were some of the ones that we used. We uh, used some few shot uh, warm start approaches there and some of the kind of tuning via the prompt builder. Pardon me. And what we were able to do was use this to auto label data to ultimately train, uh, in this case, a much smaller model, Roberta, and we could have gone even 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 smaller, but this is you know, this is still a decently uh, large model. But um, basically, a model that's about fourteen hundred times as small compared to to GPT three, and we were able to do all of this with less than one percent the number of manually labeled data points. So, in other words, less than one percent of the manual labeling and the cost associated with that for a model that is fourteen hundred times smaller through this data centric development approach. Um, and I, I won't break down the, um, you know, the inference cost is also, uh, you know, less than 0.1% uh, if you think about scaling it. So more details there, happy to spend some of the Q&A talking about that case study in more depth. But I do want to wrap up uh, the, the main presentation so we can start making this more interactive. I want to thank everyone for joining and just give a heads up uh, quickly that on December 15th, we're going to have a more extensive live demo that actually goes into much more detail and a full walkthrough of how you actually use those different techniques foundation model warm start to jumpstart your auto labeling of, of data with foundation models, foundation model prompt builder to help you actually fine tune and develop and, and refine the output for domain specific use cases via prompt engineering, and then fine tuning of foundation models. That'll be led by my co-founder and head of our research team, Braden Hancock. And then we're also gonna be having on Jan 17, a foundation model summit. It'll uh, be a virtual webinar with an in-person event. And we're gonna have folks from a whole bunch of great places uh, where we're, um, uh, still getting the sign-up list, but it, it should be um, some some great mix of both academic and industrial uh, friends talking about foundation models and uh, how they intersect with data-centric topics and real-world production. So with that, I'm going to end my screen share, and I'm excited now to jump into the Q&A. Uh, give me one second just to rearrange screens. And by the way, John, just to reemphasize, um, if, if uh, or John and, and everyone here, if folks want to um, join live and and uh, um, do it that way, more than happy to have you. Otherwise, I'll start going through the the Q and A now. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up. And again, thank you all for uh, the time and 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 now for all these great questions. So let me go through uh, some of these these questions. So. Um, I'll start with, with, again, just Srini's question. I'm happy to go back to this. I'll just note quickly, um, you know, the, the question here is, what is a foundation model? So first and foremost, when I say foundation model, I, I you know, this is, I mean this synonymously with what are often called large language models, something like, a, you know, a GPT-3, but also something like a DALI or a stable diffusion over, over you know, multimodal data or CLIP. Um, Lots more that we can talk about there to, to recap the, you know, the, the, the amazingness and, and exciting new wave that is foundation models or large language models. But for those that are familiar with the term large language model, I'll just uh, quickly clarify that, you know, we like the foundation model term. It, it is something where, um, you know, a bunch of our, uh, our colleagues at Stanford, um, my co-founder, Chris, uh, uh, who was part of starting the Center for Research on Foundation Models there, a bunch of folks are going to be talking at our foundation model summit. They've been pushing the foundation model term, and um, you know I think there's some some debate on Twitter around what what you know what term is the best to use. I'll just say from the snorkel perspective, we like the foundation model phrasing a because these models are are, are really you know a lot of the exciting progress is going multimodal um, beyond just text and language to to say image and beyond. So foundation model is more inclusive of that um, that 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 vector of progress. Also because I like the metaphor, and this was again why you know uh, our, our, our friends and colleagues at Stanford, uh, in many ways, were, were coming up with this term. You know, a found, uh, these models are, are amazing foundations to build on, but they need to be adapted. You know, like a foundation, you still need to build a house or a building on top of it, and the house or building you build is very specialized to the particular need and context that you have. So, 
I like this term because it, it doesn't overstate the capabilities. These are amazing foundations, but they need adaptation. They need you know uh, bridging to deployment. Um, uh, Rahul's question I, I kind of talked about. I can double back to the cost calculations, although I'll circle back to we have some estimates in that case study. So let me take a first pass over these questions. I think that um, Rahul, if you're curious or any others, um, there are some cost calculations that we ran based on public data in this um, this this uh, case study that we published. This was with my co-founder Braden and also uh, some of our research scientists, Steve, who's a professor at Brown, also and Jason, who's a, who's a research scientist at Stanford, um, and and they they break down at least one take on the cost estimations. Again, the broader point when talking about that deployment gap is just saying, look, there are a set of barriers of why it's not trivial to just serve, say, a GPT-3 in production. And cost is one of them, latency is another. Governance, in my view, at least with the types of enterprise customers we work with, is often one of the biggest ones, both in terms of you know, degree of, of, of blockage, but also how long it's likely to last, in my estimation. Uh, next uh, question, is it fair to say snorkel flow foundation model is an accelerated latent space that uh, that leverages uh, large language models and, and foundation models. This is this is a, a a really interesting question. I may not I may not get it right on the nail, uh, but if I'm interpreting correctly, you know, there's there's a um. So we we use latent in a bunch of ways, right? The the um. Uh, one way of thinking about it is that there's um, these lower dimensional spaces that um, you know we can actually interact in um, a lot of these we've thought about as embeddings um, or, or the feature representations that that these gigantic models learn and so if I'm interpreting it in that perspective then yes a lot of the idea here is that um, we can basically do labeling in this lower dimensional space which captures a lot of synonymy and variety of patterns right so Let's take a simple example of this. And 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 Kobus, I may be, you know, taking the question in the wrong direction. In which case, please uh, please jump in and 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 add it to the queue, and I'll 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 take another crack at it. But, you know, let me give a simple example of kind of how I would interpret latent or embedding space, and and what it actually looks like in in the snorkel flow approach to foundation models. So, in our basic approach that we've worked on for years, we think of something called a labeling function, and um, you know, this is in contrast to say a manual label. So let's say we're doing our spam email classification. An individual manual label would be, okay, this is spam or this is ham. And you just label one data point at a time. And this is very slow and very brittle and very difficult to maintain and adapt because you just get a pile of labels at the end. We've, you know, been pushing for years on this jump to writing what we call a labeling function that might use some piece of domain expertise to say, for example, if I see the word, um, uh, free prize, or if I see the phrase free prize in an email, I think it's spam. Now, what we are able to do, and I think this is what your point is getting to, which is a great one, with these foundation models now put into the loop, is we're able to let people effectively express that same amount of domain knowledge, but as a prompt, which is kind of like a label in latent space. So instead of just looking for the direct heuristic pattern match of free prize, I can now prompt a model and say, is this email talking about free prizes? And now the foundation model through that prompt builder approach will label anything that's roughly talking about free prizes, even if it doesn't use the phrase free prize. So we're using the generalization capabilities of these foundation models, basically to operate in a latent lower dimensional space where they're operating over concepts, not specific phrasings, but still guide it with our domain knowledge of, for example, you know, spam emails often talking about free prizes. So that's one example of how you can kind of marry the power of foundation models and the latent spaces that they operate in, they learn with some domain knowledge to, to auto label and, and tune uh, data sets and models. Um, John, I think you're on mute. Uh, it looks like we have someone who would like to come on. Uh, Alex? Yeah, let's, 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 okay. let's do it. Okay, Rahul, we'll go ahead and we'll promote you uh, up here. Let's see if we can, there we go. Uh, 
Okay, should be able to come on screen. Great, I think we're not hearing your audio. So if you could just. Hey, Rahul. Yeah. Uh, hi, I just have a quick question. So uh, to double click on the previous answer you had, um, so you're basically not just looking at doing a text lookup to look for a free prize keyword in a in an email. You're actually asking the model, hey, is this text talking about a free prize? Uh, yes, exactly. And and I think that's um that's one of the ways you can use this. But again, we like that example because you can. You know, a lot of where these things fall down is that you're 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 missing the domain knowledge for a very specialist problem. So you can still be kind of using domain knowledge, but now you're using what these foundation models are really good at, which is basically learning synonymy and synonymous patterns. That's one way of using them through the prompt builder. Could it could it be talking about let's say um, like a like a Disneyland event, uh, and then one of the small things in the whole email is about a free prize, which is actually the spam. Um, would it be able to detect that or would it just gravitate towards, oh, there's like 15 mentions of, you know, a Disneyland and then a one small mention of, oh, get this free prize. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the, 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 the ways that the ways of orienting these models to kind of context and especially context in longer form, you know, documents, images, et cetera, is still something that I think that the whole field is working with. And the approach that we kind of take there is, okay. We don't expect these things to be perfect for all the complexities and various reasons that data is complex, like like what you mentioned, the fact that there's like in a long email, there's maybe multiple different things that's, that are being, you know, being talked about. Um, and there's all this context because maybe I'm, you know, actually operating a free prize business and I'm getting a lot of emails about free prizes that are very much not spam. And, you know, you don't have that context available. That's one of the big overarching overarching reasons why these foundation models don't just kind of magically get everything correct, but um, that's also where, you know, we're trying to use them with other techniques so that you can, you know, the basic workflow in, in Circle, for example, is, okay, use them to auto do some auto labeling, then use some guided analysis tools to figure out where the error modes are. For example, where, you know, it was picking up on one small part of a broader email and write corrective, uh, you know, labels or labeling functions to, to iterate on that. So one of the key points is foundation models will make mistakes on specific problems. And the question of how do you correct them, we think is a data centric one. Like think about the options. Either you can correct them by calling and trying to patch their parameters. People are doing cool work there, but like how the heck do you go and patch 500 billion parameters to kind of correct some misunderstanding about, you know, context of emails, or you can just go to the data and iterate on correcting the data to fix these error modes. And that's the approach we take. And that's kind of what's enabled in, in, in this, this snorkel workflow. Does that make sense at a high level? Thank you. Thank you for the awesome question. Great. Uh, we have uh, another person joining us here, Tom. Uh, before uh, we take Tom's question, uh, just in case folks do have to drop off and you have asked a question in the uh, chat, we will be uh, following up with you over email. So we'll try to get uh, answers out to everyone's questions over email uh, as well. So. Uh, I'll let you go ahead, uh, Tom, and ask your question. Thanks. Hey, my name is actually Yashan. I'm using my uh, buddy Tom's uh, link. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, I know when you're trying to prompt stable diffusion, a lot of the art is, you know, writing a long form piece of text that's kind of descriptive. Um, is there something similar when it comes to using um, large language models for the warm start problem? Like, instead of asking, is this spam, could you ask questions like, would the typical user in Mexico find this email annoying? Like, is there any help to kind of ask like more creative questions that might, you know, as you said, like a natural scientist kind of get the large language model to kind of answer the question in a slightly different way so we can kind of get maybe multiple, you know, weak supervision models out of the same large language model, basically. That, that's an awesome, uh, I'm trying to say that's an awesome prompt. That's an awesome question, but it's not just a question. It's a, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nicely refined opinion as well. So, um, and by, by the way, John, I know we're at time now, but if, if we're good, I'd, I can go for a little bit longer. Um, yeah, uh, we can we can definitely wanna... stay on uh, for folks that want to stay on. Uh, if folks do have to drop again, we will follow up uh, with any questions uh, over email, and there will be a short survey in Zoom. So we do ask that uh, you take our our Zoom survey. Um, yes, so I'm yeah, sorry, John. I promise. A bit longer. I promise, John, to plug the survey. So please take the survey so we know how we can make these things more useful, especially when we're taking now potentially over an hour of your time. 
Um, for those that have to drop, thank you so much for joining. We'll try to get to your questions in the Q&A, as John mentioned, um, as follow-up, even if you have to drop up before then. And for folks that can stay, uh, um, uh, we'll, we'll stay on for another, uh, I can stay till 11.15 uh, Pacific time. So another, uh, anyone who wants to stay another 10, 15 minutes. Um, okay, so back to this question. This is this is exactly what we're trying to support in the in the prompt builder. So all this kind of creative prompt engineering. Let's take a step back from Snorkel specifically first and just say it's indeed, you know, and there are a lot of jokes about it on Twitter that they're now prompt engineering is going to become a full time job. I, I don't you know view that as much as a as a joke. I think that's effectively what 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 we're doing. I think there's some interesting takes of kind of viewing this as a query language for the knowledge that's stored in these big models. I don't know how to act on that formally yet, but I like that idea. Of this is like this big kind of embedded database of knowledge soaked up from the web um, and prompts are like queries. And it's a very powerful because it's natural language with very imprecise and tricky uh, um, you know, type of, of query language. Um, uh, some some great folks in my co-founder Chris's lab at Stanford uh, just put out a paper um, that we have linked that uh, kind of formalizes how you can view prompts as types of weak supervision where they're kind of noisily getting at the right information, kind of like you hinted at, which ties into the formalisms we've worked at. So if you want to go into the, the bowels of how the theory connects to the stuff we've worked on over the years at, at, at the root, that, that would be a, a cool paper to look at. But, and the research team here, uh, Braden and, and Ryan Smith on our team also put something out um, a few months back as well there. But back to your actual question, that is exactly kind of what we want to, that kind of creativity to ask and prompt more fine in, in a more targeted way is exactly what we want to offer with the prompt builder. So warm start is basically just doing the the simplest zero or few shot approach poss possible, right? So the zero shot approach would be just basically prompt the model. Is this insert class name here? If you have 10 classes, it'll just prompt it in the most generic way possible. Is this spam? Is this ham? The prompt builder now lets you use some of that expert, that domain expertise of I forgot your exact example, but saying, okay, I'm a company in Mexico and I need to understand like the geographical specific, geographic specific, you know, proclivities here, or I have some way of prompting the model, like stable diffusion, what you say it's trending on ArtStation HQ. And that presumably gets you to a latent space of the data the model was trained on that looks better, you know, and, and um, you can now kind of experiment with all of that in our prompt builder. And the cool thing is that in Snorkel's formalism, a prompt is just another what we would call a labeling function. Mm -hmm. So your prompts don't need to be perfectly accurate and you don't need to find the perfect one. You just create a whole bunch of them and you dump it in and Snorkel's weak supervision engine figures out how to kind of refine and tune and combine them, uh, which if you haven't followed our work there, then you can ignore that part. If you have and you're familiar with the, now the growing field of weak supervision, it's 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 one and the same thing. And uh, And in that view, again, what, is, what are the practical ramifications? A lot of people are sitting now trying to prompt foundation models with just the right random clever prompt uh, that like says just the right kind of weird things to get it right. Our view is great, do some of that development. That's the toolkit, the prompt builder that I briefly showed off and we'll show more about coming up. Um, but also just dump in a bunch of your prompts and mm -hmm. let weak supervision mm -hmm. modeling take care of mm -hmm. figuring out which are more or less accurate, how to combine right. them, how to deconflict, et cetera. That builds on years of work that we and others have done in this area. Got it. Totally makes sense. Thanks. Great. No, thanks Alex. for the great question. Yeah, and thank you for coming on stage. Uh, we do have a question from Andrew. I'm just going to read out some of the questions where folks are still uh, here live, Alex. Um, so Andrew asks, uh, in addition to FMs to effectively label data, can Snorkel Flow also perform transfer learning on FMs to train and optimize the discriminative model? Yes, absolutely. I know it's a it's a mouthful, uh, the, the, the different features, because we, we have a whole bunch that we're adding in, but the the fine-tuned feature, if I'm in, um, uh, yeah, so, so, so the basic transfer learning approach that we support would be fine-tuning. So if you just want to take a foundation model and now fine-tune it to adapt it for the problem, you can now do that with a, a push-button fine-tuning uh, plugin that I showed. So the, again, the standard thing of how do I take this great foundation model and transfer it, you know, trans, uh, do fine-tuning as the most predominant method um, that we support now push-button. You can view everything that we talked about as a form of transfer learning. The classic idea of transfer learning is take some knowledge that's baked into model A or data set A and apply it to model B on data set B or task B. And you can view everything we're doing there as a way of trying to do that transfer. 
in a very data centric human loop way as well. Great. Uh, and Matthew asks, hypothetically, if all of your training data were labeled, would you still expect the Roberta model on legal data, for instance, to outperform fine tuned large language models? Is that because it's hard to train large language models on a large volume of data? Or are you suggesting the main advantage is most of your training data is unlabeled? Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So, you know, the first thing just to, to kind of uh, just to, uh, you know, recap the, the question, uh, um, you know, the first the, the first thing is cost advantage. Right. So the first thing is, OK, if I don't have, uh, you know, the labeled um, uh, training data, how can I get there in a faster way? And that's where Snorkel Flow's programmatic and, and weak supervision approaches it can help make that a lot faster and also more adaptable. Because the thing that people always forget to think about is, OK, great. We're all focused on the zero to one challenge of getting to a first training set. How do I adapt it over time as data changes, output objectives change? That's that's the real challenge that most mature teams start running into. And um, when you have a programmatic approach to labeling, you can also adapt your label training set much faster, uh, not just label. That's a side note. But to your question, if I'm interpreting correctly, is if labeling was an issue, let's say I have, you know, my problem is one where I get the labels for free, or I just have my labeled training set already. Um, you know, would I still expect the Roberta, the smaller model, say, to to kind of outperform using that same amount of training data, fine tune large language models? And in the results of this case study, you can see that if you just hold the training la the label training data constant, and I use you know experiment A as I fine tune GPT three, and experiment B as I use it to train or fine tune Roberta. You can see that the the scores are about approximate. I think fine tuned on at least one scale of training set gets a little bit higher. Um, so our goal was just to show that you can get to roughly the same accuracy in a significantly cheaper way, both cheaper to do the training labeling and cheaper to serve the smaller model. However, there actually are instances that we've seen and that are reported and and uh, and and studied in the literature where you actually do get performance increase by distilling into a smaller model. And there are a couple of interesting explanations of why that may happen. You can view kind of distilling from a gigantic model into a smaller model as um, a form of compression or regularization that can actually help make results more robust. You can view it as kind of training a really targeted specialized model. Intuitively, that should make some sense that gigantic generalist model that's just slightly fine-tuned could be outperformed by a a, a trained from scratch specialist model given enough labeled training data. So there are instances in which given the same amount of training data, you can actually get better performance by um, by putting it into a smaller model. But the baseline we're trying that we were anchored on that case study is if we don't have our training data labeled, how much is it going to cost us to get to that point in the two approaches? Um, hopefully that helps with that question. Great. Um, we've got a question from Anu. Um, two questions in one. Uh, the first is, is the objective of foundation models to generate more data for simpler models, such as Roberto, which I think you kind of hit on in that question. Then two, uh, can I use chain of thought prompting approach in the snorkel workflow? That's a great one. So, so chain of thought prompting, um, we are absolutely going to have support for. I don't know if, uh, if Brain and team have an estimate on that, uh, but Right now, what we support is the we have a couple baked in templates. We have the uh, and then we have the kind of advanced mode has the ability to have kind of generic prompts um, with slot filling and then that kind of arbitrary code mapper that maps from the output of the prompt to your set of class labels. Um, so right now that um, uh, won't like that UI support doesn't support, you know, full like all of the chain of prompting a chain of thought prompting type approaches but we do have that support via the python sdk and we will also most likely move that kind of stuff into the ui as well great um one other thing i see uh honor bond here i know john you're also selecting for people who are still here but i'll i'll just note yeah. you know how, what will be the guidance for industry users to choose prioritize among the four options provided prompt based yes no uh um you know various other ones our, our key you know, opinion here is that, uh, you know, we want to be data driven around all of this. You know, we, we don't think um, that the answer should be there's one magical prompting technique or one magic labeling technique. 
it's it, you know the real world is too complex for that. Our goal with with uh, everything we build at least in Snorkel Flow is to provide a development and experimentation platform that lets you go through this rapid data centric iteration to figure out what works best. So the idea is that you write a labeling function that could be a heuristic or a regex. It could be now one of these you know prompts that can be super powerful. You use that to quickly train a model. It can be done in a couple of seconds. It gives feedback on where is are, where are you know we doing well in the data space and where are we having error modes. And then analysis tools guide you to those error modes where you can actually then you know edit, refine, add, etc. So in other words, the answer here is not okay. Here's your rule of thumb. This is the one you should do. It's just start writing some. We also have auto suggestions in Snorkel Flow to provide guidance to get started, and then use the data-driven analysis tools to figure out where to edit or, or try different approaches as appropriate. Because um, like again, I'll just probably got one more question we can do, Alex. Yeah. Uh, and I'll just say, here. by the way, the, the, the field is exploding in terms of, of different types of prompting approaches, different types of foundation models, different ways of using them. Our goal is to provide a very flexible platform so you can use all of these techniques you can use data-driven and, and automated techniques to refine and combine and tune them. And you can combine them with other techniques that are often even more powerful, like writing a regex or labeling some data points by hand. Because let's not forget, you know, as powerful as these, these models are, they don't have all of the rich domain expertise for your very specific production problem necessarily baked into them. So often just labeling a few data points from your experts, writing a heuristic labeling function can correct error modes where these, you know, very impressive, but still very dumb in many ways, foundation models fall down. And it's the combination of all of those techniques that lead to the best score. Great. Um, yeah, I guess we have probably time for one more. One more. Uh, and it looks like we probably have a uh, data-centric foundation model AMA in our future here. So we do have a lot of questions uh, that we weren't able to answer today. Uh, so we'll pick one more and then we'll follow up with folks uh, over email and, and try to do an AMA. Uh, here after uh, the Thanksgiving holiday. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fun. Um, maybe, well, John, do you want to pick up from someone who's still here, uh, if possible? And otherwise, um, uh, you can I'll just pick some. a random one. Yeah, pick pick one that's you like, because folks are dropping off here. Okay, I'll just do a quick answer to one that was uh, next in my, my queue. So from Lucas, can we double click on the applications we think foundation models are useful for today versus where we think predictive models still play a significant role? Um, you know, so so um, if I go back to that kind of quad chart that I at least find helpful in thinking about this, you know, the the key axis on the bottom, the x-axis is, um, you know, are we doing kind of generative? Basically, what are the accuracy requirements? Are we just looking for something that can generate some samples um, that are okay that I can refine, or are we looking for something that can actually, you know, output a specific label with high accuracy, you know, with guarantees? And roughly, I think of this and the formal you know, way of really dividing this usually is a generative model where we're trying to generate some data that we then refine versus a discriminative or predictive model where we're trying to predict something and we measure the accuracy and we want that accuracy to be very high. Um, so that's the first divide. And, you know, the space of generative applications is, is booming with creativity right now. So, you know, I, 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 um, I don't have an exhaustive list of, of those, but I think we see a lot of things around like editing copy text, right? The foundation model kind of generates some text that you know is is um, a decent start, and then you edit it to correct you know specific things. The um, uh, uh, the foundation model generates some images, and you tweak your prompts and play around until you and maybe you also then manually edit the image to get the one that you want. Those kinds of applications are awesome, and they're all about these kind of human loop processes where you, you don't need it to be right. You don't with some 99% accuracy. It's not even clear how to define that measure. You just need it to kind of get you started. Um, Again, the discriminative or predictive type of application is I need something to label this contract as one of 100 classes with you know, above 95% accuracy. I need uh, this model to extract or tag entities or, or answers in this, this, uh, this you know, clinical trial document with X percent accuracy. That's kind of where this adaptation gap really comes to bear, and that's where we've, we've been focused. And then the last bit is that that little bottom part it is true that if you look at demos uh, out in the space, 
there are cases where for really simple predictive or discriminative modeling problems, you know, you don't need that much data to fine tune or, 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 or prompt. You, know, you have zero or few shot approaches where just the class names or, or just a few labels get you a pretty decent answer. Um, that's actually what we do with warm start. So the second you upload data to the snorkel, you click that warm start button, we apply one of those kind of, you know, standard zero a few shot approaches, and we get you to the accuracy level that that kind of simplistic approach would get you to. If your problem is really simple, like actually say hammer spam detection or, you know, restaurant reviews, you know, good, bad, or okay. Um, you know, when I say simple, I usually mean kind of simpler data, more well represented on the web text these models are trained on, um, fewer things to label. So like binary three-way classification, not six, seven, 800-way classification. In that easy regime, you actually can just zero shot or few shot your way to a decent score. So, but that upper right quadrant where not only do you have to train this predictive discriminative model, but you're doing it in a much more complex setting. That's where, well, first of all, that's where a lot of the value in AI lives today, at least in our, in our viewpoint on, on the industry. And number two, that's where these, these adaptation deployment gaps will, will block you. Okay, I know we're over. Um, thank you all so much for the time today. This was awesome, especially for those of you that stayed over uh, and, and even came on live and looking forward to having more discussion here and to interact with many more of you um, as we roll out these features through SnorkelFlow. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. And do please take the survey uh, that you'll be presented with from Zoom. Take care.